Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the um, February webinar of um, SAS um, SLDS session. So uh, a few housekeeping things at the beginning. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, type in the um, Q and A session. Or uh, I've allowed everybody to to be able to talk. So you can either like um, talk directly to Ray, or um, if you, can, you uh, or you can raise a hand if there's like multiple questions, uh, multiple people who wants to ask question at the same time. And uh, we will also have a Q and A session at the end of the talk. Um, so let's get started. Okay, so thank you everyone for attending this um, webinar. Um, our speaker today is uh, Ray Song from Amazon. She is a um, senior principal scientist and she got her PhD in statistics from University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2006 and has been a faculty at NC State since 2012. Um, Ray is a very uh, talented young researcher has has uh, won a lot of rewards. Um, she, for example, the NSF Career Award, and she has served uh, um, as associate editor for many statistical journals such as Annals of Statistics, JASA, JCGS, and many others. And uh, she's also a fellow of ASA and um, IMS. Um, Ray's research interest includes. Um, reinforcement learning, casual inference, precision health, and knowledge graph. And today she's going to tell us about um, causal decision making. So let's welcome Ray. Thank you, Jiuhua, for the nice introduction and for uh, inviting me to speak here. Um, thanks everyone for being here today. It's my great pleasure to share some of my recent work and the thoughts about uh, causal decision making. Um, this is a work mostly done prior to my full time at Amazon. I would like to uh, thank my collaborators um, uh, helping with this work, especially for this talk. Um, I want to thank uh, my former students, Henry Tsai, who is right now an um, assistant professor at UC Irvine, and the uh, current students, Lin Ge and uh, Yang Xu, their students at NC State, and um, Ren Zhe Wan, former student, uh, right now applied scientist at Amazon. Also uh, acknowledge the grant support from NSF and NIH. Um, so I, for today, I want to talk about uh, some overview on causal decision making, in particular, the three components about uh, causal structure learning, causal effect learning, and the causal policy learning. I name them in this way, but you can see there are a lot of things are very classical in the literature. I would like to put them into a framework on decision making through a causal lens. And then I want to over, give an overview about the major paradigms in causal decision making. Feel, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions or comments during the middle. So let's start from some examples and overview. Um, this is a, a plot about the precision medicine. So um, during the whole medical practice, the, pa the patients will come to the doctor and their individual characteristics will be collected. So the doctor will make a decision, recommend some treatment to the patient based on their health condition with a goal of improving the patient's health outcome. And the whole procedure can certainly iterate. So a second example I want to talk about today is a ride hailing platform which is a centralized decision platform. When a passenger put a request of a ride to the platform, there are a lot of decisions the platform needs to make. For example, how to dispatch a driver, what price should be set, and how to match the driver and the passenger. So um, this is an example of a sequential decision making as well. A third example I wanted to talk today is the recommender system. Uh, for example, for the movie recommender system, every time they, the platform will recommend a set of movies to the customer and their goal is try to maximize the click-through rate or some other metrics. So in this type of a real world application, uh, they often have a, a lot of related items 
for example, different movies may share the same genre and some other characteristics. And new items are frequently introduced. For new items, we often call them cold start because there are no previous um, history for those movies. And another example is e-commerce, where uh, for different products, there are often uh, different options and they could lead to different reward. So how can the platform choose the best product in the sense that they can get the uh, best profit is a problem of interest. And in this type of application, there are often a large number of related tasks with the same set of options. And again, the cold start tasks are very common here. And those tasks are often with limited exploration opportunities. So how do we make a decision in such a case is also of interest. So those are all very high level examples. And I wanted to step back to think about the philosophy, the rationale behind those decision making. So in typical decision making, often the implementation of an intervention, a treatment, a action can lead to a chain of events or sometimes the graph of events. They have a various relationship and all those events ultimately cause the final outcome. So how do we determine whether one variable or we call them the cause directly or indirectly influence another variable? And how do we quantify the effects of those actions? And then based on the information, based on those causal relations we have learned, how can we learn and evaluate the best policy? How can we make the decision is our ultimate goal. So based on this logic, we can decompose our thinking procedure into three steps. First, we can identify the causal relation through causal structure learning. When we know the causal skeleton or the graph structure of those events, we can try to understand and quantify the effects of those causal relations through causal effect learning. And then we can apply the above knowledge to inform decision making through the causal policy learning, meaning we want to learn the policy and those are based on the causal relation we learned. We can use a unified potential outcome framework to solve this decision making problem. It is also called a counterfactual framework. So let's start by reviewing some of the mathematical notations. We use the, um, okay. Can you see my screen or is that a, a something on top of it? Can you see the full screen now? Yeah, it's full screen. Okay, thank you. So uh, for, let's use some notations to illustrate the whole framework. Uh, for a one stage data on a single subject, we use S to denote the state, which can include the baseline characteristics, prior treatment, and so on. We use A to denote the action, which may include the treatment options, regimen choices, and so on. Then we use R to denote the outcome. Most of the time, we assume the larger values, the better. And uh, we use R star A, a variable to denote the potential outcome. Uh, which is the outcome that would result if a subject were assigned to treatment A. So in practice, say we have a binary treatment taking value zero or one, when they observe the treatment is zero, then you can only observe R star zero. You're not able to observe R star one. Um, so potential outcome can also be treated as a missing data problem in this case, because we can only observe um, one outcome when the treatment is realized. And a dual operator is another way to describe the potential outcome. This is introduced by Judy Apur and his collaborators. So it refers to a mathematical operator to simulate interventions 
that hold constant while keeping the rest of the model unchanged. It has been discussed extensively in the previous literature of the equivalence between the potential outcome framework and the dual operator. And uh, we also can define the single stage policy or decision rule D as a function of the state and the output is the action. The value function is defined as a function of the decision rule D. It is an expectation of the potential outcome which takes the input of an action and this action is the output of the decision rule D. We can define the Q function, which is a function of the state action pair. And it is a ex conditional expectation of the potential outcome given the state action pair. So the optimal decision rule D is defined as the argmax of the value function indexed by D, the decision. So this framework is also called individualized treatment regimen, in short as ITR. Next, let's move on to the multi-stage causal decision-making framework. So here in general, we denote T stages on a single subject, S, I, A, I, R, I for I from one to T. And we use S still to denote the state because we have a possibly more than one stage. So we use H T plus one to represent all the historical information up to time T plus one, which include S, I, A, I, R, I until time T and uh, uh, S at time T plus one. Uh, we use A T right now is a vector to denote all the actor action information up to time T and the reward is also a vector, including all the reward up to time t. So correspondingly, the potential outcome can be also extended to be a vector. We can define a dynamic policy or decision rule d also as a vector at each time takes input as a state and the output is an action. So the value function is defined as a weighted cumulative sum of the expected potential outcome at each stage. The optimal policy right now is argmax of the value function. So if T is of a finite stage, we often call that as dynamic treatment regimen. For example, dynamic treatment regimen is widely used in medicine where T is often of a less or a small number up to say three or four in clinical trials. And uh, in some other applications such as mobile health and games, T can be very large, say of thousands or even more. And we call them infinite horizon. I think they both can be casted into the multi-stage causal decision-making framework. So next let's talk more about the three tasks. The first task is a causal structure learning where we can consider two subtasks. First is causal discovery, where the goal is to learn a causal graph, the skeleton and the direction of the edges from the data uh, based on the framework import and the, the collaborators in causal discovery. The second subtask is causal mediation analysis, where the goal is to understand what portion of the total effect of the treatment to the outcome can be attributed to the potential mediator M. So in this case, the total effect can be decomposed as the summation of the direct effect of A to R and the indirect effect through the mediator M. Uh, let's give a high level example of the application of such causal discovery. Uh, using an example of a measure the spread of COVID-19. So back in 2020, in January, uh, China locked down Wuhan and uh, some other cities in Hubei. It's known as a treatment um, or 2020 Hubei lockdown. So this lockdown action not only directly block the disease progression, 
but also stimulate a decrease in the migration outside of Hubei. Thus, can indirectly control the disease progression. So in this case, we use R to denote the outcome, which is stopping the virus spread. And the mediators M considered here, including the migration skill of major Chinese cities outside of Hubei. So with this application, we want to quantify the causal effect of um, the action 2020 Hubei lockdown on reducing the COVID-19 spread uh, via cities outside of Hubei. Um, next, let's look at the second task, the causal effect learning. This is um, often put in the framework of causal inference, where the goal most of the time is to estimate or inference of the treatment effect um, in Inbens and the Rubin causal inference framework. So in particular, we're interested in two types of causal effect. The every treatment effect, which is a measurement of the uh, difference in the uh, treatment effect of the uh, of, of different treatment. And uh, when the uh, treatment effect difference are different for different subjects due to their uh, different characteristics, we are also interested in the conditional average treatment effect. Um, here is a, also a high level example of A-B testing, which is commonly used in practice such as medicine, marketing, psychiatry, and so on where the goal is to compare the treatments to measure the effectiveness of the treatment of interest. This A-B testing is often a good platform, a good measurement, a good realization of a causal inference because the randomization can, can often be well taken care of to control the confounders. Um, the third task is a causal policy learning where we wanted to learn the policy using the causal information we learned previously, such as the causal skeleton and its causal effect. Reinforcement learning has been a powerful tool to realize this goal of a causal policy learning. Uh, in particular, we have two sub-tasks. First is the causal the pol policy optimization, where the goal is to learn an optimal policy that maximizes the cumulative reward through the interaction of the agent with the state and or the environment. And the second subtask is the policy evaluation, where the goal is to learn and evaluate the value under a target policy or a policy of interest with the data collected under a possibly different policy, which we often call the behavior policy. There are a lot of successful applications of RL. Just to give a few very famous examples, AlphaGo is a program that can beat the human Go player back in 2017. Um, and uh, AlphaGo is a successful application of the combination of the reinforcement learning and the deep learning. The current um, greatest and the uh, the latest advance of the text generation is ChatGPT. Many of us have used this and played with this a lot. And this is also a successful application of RL, in particular, the RL from human feedback, RLHF, when people try to fine tune the large language models. Um, RL can also be applicable in medicine. So this is a uh, Ohio type one diabetes management data set. Six patients with type one diabetes were followed up and their information contains eight weeks of data, including um, continuous glucose monitoring blood glucose levels, which is the outcome. And uh, the treatment, including the insulin dose of uh, the bolus and the basal rate level, the other covariates, including the self-reported times of the meals and exercise and other health information. 
with this type of data, we can use RL to learn an optimal policy for the patients to control their blood glucose level. So having reviewed those high-level examples, let's revisit the flowchart for causal decision-making. So we cast them into three steps. The first step is causal structure learning. And the second step is a causal effect learning, whereas the third step is a causal policy learning. So there are certainly relations of the three steps. They can exist individually as well. So the methodology of CPL, such as RL, can be the tools to realize the goal of a causal structure learning and causal effect learning. And the causal mediation analysis can serve as a bridge between the causal structure learning and the causal effect learning. The second task, causal effect learning, can be viewed as a special case of a policy evaluation, a central task of a causal policy learning. Because when you take the policy as a special case, such as one size fits all, either both the treatment, either all the treatment or all the control, then the policy evaluation method can certainly be used to evaluate the causal effect. So they are intrinsically um, very closely related. That's why you can see in the later slides, the methodology share a lot of, share a lot of similarity. Um, before I move on to the major paradigms discussion, any questions or comments? So let's move on to the second part. Uh, so here I try to put the roadmap just for a high level summary. In terms of um, the classification on different type of policy, we could put them as fixed policy, meaning the policy are predetermined. They don't change over time. See here, the pi does not depend on t. Although it may depend on the state, which is time dependent. And the second class is the adaptive policy, meaning the policy can change it over time. Sometimes you heard the word on policy, so that refers to the adaptive policy, at least here. And in terms of the relations of a different state, we can classify them as independent state, meaning the state are independent across different time, or Markovian state transition, meaning we have a a Markovian relation when you perform the state transition. And we have uh, all the remaining relations into the third category. It can include the general arbitrary relations of the state transition. So then we would have a two by three, six paradigms. So I wanna see that most of the causal structure learning are focused on the paradigm one the fixed policy with independent state. Although more research uh, uh, carry on for the remaining of the paradigms. In terms of the causal effect learning or in general causal inference, I think they are mostly focused on the first role, meaning the fixed policy. So we see various discussion on dynamic treatment effect or treatment effect in panel data. Uh, so from my understanding, mostly they are fixed policy. Although we can also see a trend that more research are working along the direction of adaptive policy, such as online policy, sorry, online treatment effect evaluation. So that will be um, distributed on paradigm four, five, six. And for reinforcement learning, I think they are spread across all those paradigms. And for the um, DTR, which we are mostly familiar with in statistics, they are mostly focused on paradigm one for a single stage and the paradigm three for multi-stage. And for the bandits, mostly they are in paradigm four. And uh, for RL, especially those successful RL applications such as AlphaGo, um, ChatGPT, I think they fall into paradigm five. And paradigm two seems to be mostly well studied in offline RL. Uh, I think more research, statistical research are focusing on paradigm two. Of course, more research are called for for all the remaining um, paradigms which are less studied. Uh, so that's an overview for the paradigms. Next, let's uh, try to zoom in and discuss them one by one. 
So the first paradigm is a fixed policy with independent state. So in this paradigm, the observations, SI, AI, RI, are IAD sampled. A, the treatment can be affected by the state and both state and action will have an effect on the reward. So let's start from the discussion on the causal structure learning, where the methods can mostly be classed into three categories. Uh, the first category is the local conditional independence test, including the famous PC algorithm, where the goal is to learn the causal skeleton and to decide the direction of the edges through the testing. The second category is a functional causal model with additional assumptions on data distribution. And the third category is a score-based methods. Uh, this is less, uh, require less assumption and uh, computational faster. However, uh, it's less than, I mean, it's not as well established in theory as the first two category. So next I wanted to uh, just a brief uh, uh, discuss some of my recent work in this um, causal structure learning. So in a recent ICML paper, we introduced the concept of um, analysis of causal effect, which called ANOCA, where our goal is to try to identify, simultaneously identify the causal skeleton and estimate the individual mediator effect by incorporating the temporal causal relationship. And uh, another recent work is try to quantify uh, necessary and the sufficient causal graph. So here, the sufficiency refers to that we wanted to include enough variables um, without our major confounder. We don't want to lose variable. And the necessity means we don't want to uh, include more variables than needed. In that case, you would possibly have a a spurious variable if you do not do so. And uh, another work is about uh, to extend uh, the heterogeneous causal effect into graphical context. And in this case, we also conceptualize a heterogeneous causal graph by generalizing the causal graphical model with confounder-based interaction and the multiple mediators. So here the confounder is called a moderator. So I do think that this type of work can push the current causal graph into more uh, general framework and have a better connection with the literature in causal effect or causal inference learning. Uh, there is a question here. Does any of the works in slide 26 handle unmeasured variables? I so yeah, those are my own work. So we have not, but I realize there are some work in general to handle unmeasured confounders in color graph. Okay. So yeah. So next, let's move on to the causal effect learning paradigm one. There are a lot of literature, uh, so I not able to list all of them. In terms of the, the estimation for ATE, every treatment effect, they can be casted into three categories, the direct estimator to model the outcome regression, the IPW or important sampling estimator to model the propensity score, and the doubly robust estimator, which is a combination of the direct estimator and the IPW inverse probability weighting estimator where the goal is to achieve efficiency and doubly robustness, meaning either one of the model for outcome or propensity score is misspecified, you would still get a consistent estimator for the treatment effect. In terms of the HTE, heterogeneous treatment effect, or CATE, conditional average treatment effect, they refer to the same thing. There are a lot of learners ranging from the base learner um, to the more complicated, deep learning-based methods. So all those different methods have different applications and advantage. So they should be chosen um, appropriately based on the application. Without further introduction of the causal effect learning, let's move on to the certain task causal policy learning, 
again, this is just a biased review. Um, from my understanding, I think the causal policy learning in paradigm one, or we call them ITR. Um, well, ITR is one type of a CPL. Another type is called a subgroup analysis, which is also a policy learning where the goal here is to identify a subgroup with enhanced treatment effect. So uh, let's review both ITR and the subgroup analysis in the high level. According to the modeling type, we can put them, we can put ITR into three categories. The parametric modeling, which is featured by the Q learning, um, which directly models the Q function, mostly is parametric modeling. And the second is semi-parametric modeling, where um, the, 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 the key is to relax the model on the baseline, and the focus is on the interaction of the treatment and the covariates. So it features A learning and the further extension, including more flexible modeling for semi-parametric modeling, uh, such as semi-parametric single index and so on. And the third category is non-parametric modeling, where this uh, learning of the ITR is treated as a classification or weighted classification problem, where the weight is the outcome. So a representative work, including the robust learning, you can consider this as the minimization of the weighted misclassification rate. An outcome weighted learning can be viewed as a weighted SVM. And the first extension can certainly improve the efficiency, but it's still based on the same idea of non-parametric modeling. And for subgroup analysis, people have uh, uh, tried all kinds of analysis, such as change plane or hypothesis testing, where the goal is to identify this enhanced uh, treatment group. Uh, so in this slide, I'm trying to put a more research in terms of a say, different outcome. So in addition to the mean outcome, people may care about the quantile, say the median and some other extreme quantile. And in terms of action, in addition to discrete action, there are a lot of applications for continuous type of action. So more research are going on for this category as well. And for survival outcome, which is of a great interest in medicine. So we care about the survival probability mean survival time, median survival time, and so on. So I think there are much more research going on in this category as well. And in terms of the covariates, we do have all sorts of um, uh, issues such as high dimension. So um, it's possible to generalize the classical methods into high dimension and the various properties such as double A robust property can still maintained. And in terms of the data resource, Different data resources are often combined together and different type of data, such as missing data structure, always there. So how to develop methods to handle those data structure are of great interest. And uh, there are a lot of research going on. And I do think there is a great potential for putting those research into practice. So that's about the uh, paradigm one. Um, let's move on to paradigm two which is a fixed policy under Markovian state transition. So um, I'm trying to use this uh, power, uh, the causal diagram to illustrate the MDP. So in this case, AT is only directly affected by state ST. Both RT and ST plus one can be affected by ST and AT. Given ST and AT, RT and ST plus one are independent of the previous observation. So essentially that's the Markovian and the uh, stationarity properties of MDP. Um, there are a lot of works in this paradigm for causal policy learning. Let's start by review the famous Q learning. So this is a Bellman equation, and um, uh, left hand side is a Q function, which can be written as the expectation of the summation of the immediate reward and uh, the maximum possible future incremental reward, given the state and the action information. 
So this Q function assign values to action state pairs and it's learning how to best choose the action AT to maximize the expected sum of the incremental reward. So the optimal decision rule is just argmax of the Q function. So um, without review of the huge literature on RL, I want to focus on the statistical offline RL on the MDP. So in terms of the policy optimization, again, just by its review of my recent work. So we're trying to incorporate the uh, modeling such as the uh, mixture model into the heterogeneous Q learning, where the goal is to deal with data heterogeneity when you have a subpopulation in the whole population. And uh, we also try to extend the A-learning framework into infinite horizon where we can show the statistical efficiency. In terms of the offer policy um, evaluation, they can be casted into three categories. You can see right now a share the similarity with the evaluation of the ATE. So uh, the three categories are the direct estimator where people try to model in directly the Q function and the important sampling estimator. Here, um, we consider the marginal um, density ratio, which is the ratio of the um, sampling probability based on the target policy over the behavior policy. And the third is the doubly robust style estimator, which is a combination of the direct estimator and the important sampling estimator. And similarly, this double robust type of estimator can achieve um, efficiency and, the double, and has doubly robust properties. And a, a bit more about the OPE under extended situation. See, if we have an unmeasured confounder, in that case, we have recently proposed two solutions just based on the different application. So if you could have some mediator then it can mediate the effect of the confounder. Then we can use the backdoor um, criteria, the framework proposed in Judea Poor to handle such a situation. Or if you have instrumental variable, you can also use instrumental variable to deal with this unmeasured confounder situation. And another framework we wanted to consider is the mediated MDP, meaning if you wanted to study the mediation, uh, the, the mediator's effect, uh, meaning like as I illustrated at the beginning, you can decompose the total effect into the direct effect and the indirect effect through mediator. So we extend that situation into the MDP setting. It seems to be applicable in a mobile health study, which is illustrated in our paper. So next, let's move on to the third paradigm, which is a fixed policy under non-Markovian non transition. So it takes all the possible causal relationship into account other than those considered in paradigms one and two. So I wanna start a, a high level review on the causal effect learning for panel data. So the works listed here are still about the constant uh, treatment effect, but the data are collected through panel data, longitudinal data. So the major methods including difference in difference and the syntactic control, they are based on different assumptions. For example, DID, difference in difference will include, will need the parallel trend assumption and the synthetic control itself is an assumption. And those methods are very widely used in industry. Um, next, I wanna move on to discuss the um, CPL in paradigm three, in particular, the multi-stage DTR. So let's just use this plot to illustrate the Q function estimation and the challenge there. So at time T1, the subject's information are collected as H1, A1, and at time T2, um, information collected as H2, A2. Then we have a backward learning. We model Q2, Q function at time two, and then learn uh, D2, the policy, which is argmax of Q. And then we go back to the first stage to maximize Q1 and get the estimated optimal policy D1. So it sounds simple. However, in practice, there can be challenges in statistical inference for the first stage parameter and the value if the treatment, the optimal treatment is not unique at the second stage. 
this is a famous non-regularity issues in statistical inference for DTR. There are a lot of works discuss the possible solutions. Um, yeah, here are just two of the solutions. Try to use penalized Q learning to shrink to identify those individuals with no treatment effect. And then some um, um, other related work can make the results more um, efficient. So that's a, a review for um, the first role, the fixed policy. Uh, next, I want to move on to the discussion on the adaptive policy, starting from paradigm four. So this is a paradigm where the state are independent, but uh, the action may depend on the previous state. The treatment policy here is time adaptive. So this is commonly used in online decision-making literature, such as Band-Aids. That would directly go to the introduction for Band-Aids. Most famous Band-Aids is MAB, Martian Band-Aids, where we have an action and a reward. The procedure including select the action, receive a reward, and update my next uh, stage action. So here, the reward distribution is unknown, and our goal is to maximize the cumulative reward equivalently to minimize the cumulative regret. The three popular approaches for bandits, single task bandits, including Ipsom Grady, UCB, and Thompson Sampling, they are different in terms of how do they deal with the exploration. They can all viewed as a combination of exploration and exploitation. So for Ipsom Grady, with probability Ipsom, we randomly sample, and with probability one minus Ipsom, we maximize the outcome, the reward. For UCB, which is a short for upper confidence bound, we try to take an action that's an arc max of the upper confidence bound. This can be viewed as a summation of the estimated reward and a, a surrogacy for the standard deviation. For the Thompson sampling, we set some priors over the reward and the sample the action according to its posterior probability of being the optimal one. Uh, there are a huge literature in bandits as well. I just wanted to discuss some of my recent work in both policy optimization and the policy evaluation. So for policy optimization, we try to focus on the multitask bandits, which is the um, uh, uh, e-commerce examples I mentioned at the beginning, and the structure bandits, which handle the um, movie recommender system in the beginning. And the graph bandits here, we're trying to address the relations of a, a different agent and different reward. In terms of policy evaluation, you can again find some similarities in terms of a, a, a relation with OPE and uh, the treatment effect evaluation. So, Recently, we developed a direct methods for online decision making for Ipsom Grady and the, all the remaining uh, Thompson sampling and uh, uh, UCB. Um, so doubly robust inference can be similarly extended in this case. So the difference here, we need to carefully address the probability of exploration, but the key idea uh, follows there in the same framework. Uh, so next, I wanted to just briefly review the adaptive policy under Markovian state transition. Uh, that includes the online decision making under MDP. In terms of the policy optimization, um, it can be casted as model-free approach and the model-based approach where the state transition of the model for state transition can be estimated or is known. And for model-free approach, it can be casted as policy-based, value-based, and the actor critic, which is a combination of the policy-based and the value-based, meaning the actor uh, trying to learn the policy and the critic trying to learn the value, and the value can be used as a guide for the policy update. So in terms of the policy evaluation, it's much less studied. And the recently we proposed a sequential value evaluation framework, uh, which can be uh, applied to the online decision framework. So I think um, more research should be done in terms of policy evaluation for um, online decision-making in paradigm five. 
So here, I just wanted to briefly talk about some high-level um, applications I've done recently. So in this work, we take a model-based approach, try to um, develop a, a multi-objective reinforcement learning for infectious disease control. We combine the famous SIR model for the um, infectious disease control. And uh, um, this is another application where we're using the um, KDD uh, 2020, they have a KDD cup where they provide some open data set for us to learn uh, uh, the optimal policy for order dispatching. So we propose a um, pattern transfer learning uh, for reinforcement learning, essentially, uh, even for, so we know for the same location, uh, there are certain similarities. You would have a different performance at different time point within your day. However, we know that the relative performance of a different location will keep the same. So we use this result, we use this uh, idea to do a transfer learning um, by considering this relation. We actually use a concordance penalty. Uh, the, the result seems promising, and uh, we're able to achieve. Uh, actually, there are like more than one thousand teams attend this contact, and I think we're ranking as number seven in terms of result uh, based on this method. I think it's quite promising. So, yeah, next three applications about my recent exploration in text generation in NLP. This is very interesting. So we're trying to do the crossword puzzle with RL. I think many of us have done this before, and we were just trying to use Monte Carlo tree search. It turns out that the results are very good. We can beat 97% of the cross puzzle in the database. Uh, I have a question here. Can a link to the slides be sent? Yeah, that's possible. So the next um, application is about um, information extraction. Um, so in particular, so we're trying to use knowledge to guide the reward definition so we can um, achieve a, a nice results to improve the um, accuracy. Uh, this is based on deep Q learning. Um, so yeah, this is a, another case study where we try to uh, do rule mining over knowledge graph using reinforced learning. It has two steps. In the first step, we use reinforced learning combined with curriculum learning for rule generation to learn the value function. And then in the second step, we do online learning where we use the value function to guide the rule mining. Um, the results is also very promising. That's why I can foresee reinforcement learning is so powerful in NLP, especially the current progress in the text generation. I think this is really a very hot topic right now for um, uh, AI in general. Um, so next, let's move on to the last paradigm, which is about the adaptive policy uh, under non-Markovian transition. So that includes all the decision, online decision making under general non-MDP setting, such as confounded MDP, um, partially observable uh, palm DP as well. Uh, so this paradigm is much less studied compared with the previous five paradigms. So here I only list the policy optimization uh, because I have not seen policy evaluation yet, but maybe there are some, I just haven't found them yet. Uh, so for policy optimization, when the horizon is short, so you only have two or three horizon, it is it's still feasible to learn a time dependent policy that directly utilizes the vector of all the historical information for decision making. So this is studied recently, um, and um, it's called the DTR band-aids. And if the number of horizon is more than say two or three stages, this is not feasible for the computation. So um, some other approach, including the um, solution for POMDP, say people try to infer the underlying state using historical information, and then use the inferred state distribution as a belief state for decision making. So some other uh, recent approaches, including apply some neural nets, uh, try to incorporate such information for direct learning the policy uh, from a, a sequence of um, uh, history transition data. 
um, yeah, policy evaluation is not there yet, but I do uh, think there are a lot of uh, applications that need potential uh, new methods for policy evaluation. Um, I think I have uh, covered all the six paradigms and uh, I will stop here for questions. Thank you.